My journey to creating charter schools was um, in and out of traditional politics. I, um, while I was in college at UC Santa Barbara, I started a college Democrat group. I was head of Students for Carter in 1980 in the state of California. And then I ran for a while Jack O'Connell's first run for the state assembly. He later became superintendent of public instruction. And um, at the end, Willie Brown got really heavily involved, and Jack won by a little over 1,000 votes. And so, you know, and from there, I interned for Jerry Brown um, when he was governor of California. Um, got a job right out of college uh, putting the Olympic torch relay together um, that was managed by one of Brown's um, advanced guys and, um, and spent a year and a half on the road. Went right from that to the Gary Hart for President campaign and then worked for Geraldine Ferraro after that. And, and a pattern of working for the long shot dreamer candidates. So you remember President Hart and then there was President Brown and there was President Babbitt and then there was uh, President Bob Kerry, we all remember him, and then the first dreamer um, was Barack Obama. But interspersed between that is I, I, I sold a book about my travels on the torch run and I got a nice big six figure advance which was you know, unheard of. Um, that kept me out of law school in the Reagan 80s. And then, um, 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 and then I worked at Rock the Vote after working for the state Democratic Party. And so there was always a healthy curiosity of what it means to be a Democrat. What is my activism really about? What is it producing? And, um, and I think the biggest friction of just being involved in politics from, that was different from the people around me was that I grew up you know, in, in, in pretty um, sometimes dire poverty. I was in and out of foster care when I was a kid. I was raised by a single mom, and um, um, I don't think she ever made more than a thousand dollars in a week, a month, you know. Uh, and so um, we had to like, make a lot of tough decisions on, on budgeting during that time. And and but when I was entering high school, my mom moved us, my little brother and I, eight blocks from San Jose schools to Cupertino schools, so I could go to Cupertino High School in what is now Silicon Valley. It was this pre-Apple days. Um, but it's where Hewlett Packard engineers sent their kids. And so when I went to that high school at age 14, um, my culture changed quickly because I was around kids who talked about going to college not as some epic dream, you know, fairy tale, as actually a, a rite of passage. You know, it's just everybody went to college at Cupertino High School. And I, up until that time, never really thought about those things. We thought about how to survive till Friday, and my culture changed. And I would come home and tell my mom, um, you know, I think, it's, uh, I think I'm going to go on to college. And she would say, that's great, that's nice, and I'd rub my feet and get me a Diet Coke. And, um, and, and I just made me more resilient to want to go to college. And, uh, but that high school in California at that time was a pre-Prop 13. I'm the class in 1977 at Cooper Junior High School, which means I'm the last year of the fully funded Pat Brown Master Plan of Education envy of the world public education system in California. The year after I graduated from high school, we had Prop 13. And, um, but there was, as good as that high school was, it was really built for 20% of the people. And they used to tell us, I remember I could hear it from teachers, 20% of you are gonna do great things and go on to college, um, you start businesses, become lawyers, doctors. 20% of you, we, we really can't do much for. But the vast majority, as long as you can read and write, there is an economy um, where you can, if you have a strong back or you can drive a truck or do a lot of different things, you can raise a family and buy a home and send your kids to college. And in my adult lifetime, our economy has changed and that once great public education system was being dismantled. And what passed as debate as I was involved in politics for all those years was the left, which I'm a member of, just kind of being incredibly unresponsive, fleeing the system, and just saying, just give more money to a failed centralized system that was built for a different time. And then the right's response was, it's the teachers union's fault, uh, let's privatize it, or indifference. Now I understand why the right is the way they are, um, being a yellow dog Democrat, but what I couldn't understand is how my political involvement, working on campaigns, working in politics, trying to make change, netted so little result on education. Um, the one example that changed that was Gary Hart, who was a state senator in Santa Barbara, who everybody at UCSB worked for and adored. Um, he sponsored the first charter school law in 1992. And that created an alternative. And he was a liberal Democrat. And I think a lot of the original cracks that led to charter schools were initiated by liberal Democrats and Democratic Party folks. Um, and I remember running into Gary 
um, at a funeral for uh, Walter Capps, who was a professor of mine and a mentor who later on became a congressman. And Gary had mentioned to me just off the hand, I hadn't seen him in a while, and he said, and I was talking about schools, and, um, and I was at a place in time where I was searching, and he said, you know, you should go talk to this guy, Reed Hastings. He, I just met him. Um, he's a Silicon Valley guy, he's up at Stanford, and he's thinking about sponsoring um, an initiative to lift the cap of my original legislation. And so, Reed Hastings, I just remember writing that down uh, later on that night. And, uh, and that began my, somewhat my weird journey into, um, into charter schools. Now, at that same time, those years leading up to, those three or four years leading up to that, I had lost a younger brother um, to drugs. Um, I'd lost a mom. Um, and I buried a stepdad who I wasn't that close with. But, and so around that same time, I was also, I was working on television at Disney. They produced some shows that I was working on and hosting and co-hosting. And they, I had to sign a paperwork that said, what's your next of kin? And I had a chocolate lab that was my next of kin. I mean, I really, it's a weird feeling when you're in your mid to late thirties and you don't have anybody. And so that midlife crisis and searching how I went from having this pretty terrific life, um, going to college, having these great jobs, writing a book, doing things that a lot of my friends were not able to do, I was kind of lucked into or, 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 or seized at the time, all of a sudden my life unraveled and that losing my younger brother who came from the same mom and two kids that were raised by the same love to have two incredibly different outcomes. And those outcomes started to change dramatically when we entered into that big, huge high school. That high school in Cupertino was really built for me. I, I could shoot three-pointers. I was loud. Um, I had a big personality. Um, my younger brother, Michael, was chubby. You know, his glasses never quite fit. You know, he was quiet. He was artistic. Um, he would try to, ch when he tried to um, join things, like he tried to join the band. And when the chubby kid joins the band, the instrument they always get, seem to get is the, the tuba. Now, if you've ever seen a kid get on and off a school bus with a tuba, it's very funny and very sad at the same time, especially with your, your younger brother. And our lives just started separating. Um, it was the late 70s, so he did pretty much every drug you could do, and I still never had a drug um, harder than a you know, glass of red wine. And so um, um, I played basketball. Um, he dropped out. You know, I became student body president. Um, uh, he took the GED. I went to college. He went in the Navy because the judge told him he had to go to the Navy or go to jail. And our lives just started separating. And so when it didn't end well for, for Michael, it really haunted me. Like, and, and how did I get all the breaks and how did he not get those breaks? And I thought back about where that separation started happening and it was in high school. Now it wasn't the high school's fault. It's just, you know, those schools were really built for a certain group of kids. And, um, and a lot of kids just get you know, left behind and fall through the cracks. And so that was a haunting memory. Um, so being in a midlife crisis mode, being alone, still looking for the, the, the purpose of politics, um, and then finding somebody like Reed Hastings and Don Shalvey at that time who were optimistic. Uh, they weren't driven by fear which everything, you know, in politics and business, you're, just, you're, you're, you're shackled by fear. You don't try things, you're afraid to fail. And being around Reed, who was a, you know, a real, pro, a real, it seemed like a real authentic member of Silicon Valley, where my roots are from, um, was a breath of fresh air.